Hey guys, great to have you here. I'm Rob Tato. Today we're doing it a little differently. I do have someone special, industry veteran, 31 years of experience managing mostly oil, energy, energy plays, energy related stocks. One of the best in the business in Canada. There's really nobody that does it like Rafi. So Rafi, I'm thrilled to have you here today with us. Uh, we've not talked about what we're talking about, so I would like this to be a real conversation. Yep. So I, I know you run uh, what is it, a couple bill or something like that, one and a half or two billion, something like that of assets. So that's a significant amount. It's all you do. You're on BNN all the time. So I know you've had a really busy day. You're traveling through, what is it, Western Canada? The hinterland right now, yeah. Yeah. So you're you're freezing. You just got injured on the slopes. Yeah. Um, and yeah. now you're talking to me about energy on a Wednesday afternoon. So thank you for taking the time. Uh, where do you want to start? Well, I... I you know, I think it was that the whole concept of getting out and presenting this story. Uh, this is the the last third of the leg of Canada that we're covering, and it's really come as a result of a, an analysis we do every six months of the market. We try to make sure these presentations don't run out of date in six weeks. We like them to kind of last six months, and so we look back a lot of times and try to understand what's happened to help us understand what's going to happen. And it doesn't always necessarily tell you anything. Over the holidays, when I looked back, trying to understand what was happening and what could happen, there was an incredibly compelling picture that we wanted to tell. And so we, we launched a marketing program to present this, and uh, this is what we're on the road to tell you about right now. All right, remember, no banging the table, right? Right, right. Sorry, <laughs> it makes too much noise. Yeah, so, so, okay, so I'm excited about that. I've been an energy bull probably because of my dad most of my life. So I've always had in my portfolio a little bit overexposed to energy. Uh, it's been really good lately. But obviously these two themes that you want to talk about, maybe we should start there. Sure. And, and interestingly enough, like I'm born and raised in the oil patch. My family was in it. My father was an energy geologist. He was a, he was a uh, professor of geology. And I learned and I cut my teeth in the 70s in energy in the exploration basin that we had. And that basin was spending about a half a billion a year in the basin. Then I went after school to a company called Renaissance Energy and a little startup Canadian Natural Resources was starting at the time. And we were exploiting the basin at that time. We were taking these discoveries and trying to find how big they were. We were taking technologies to get more of that oil and gas out. We started spending a billion, two billion, four billion. By then I went into energy banking and worked with one of the preeminent energy banks for 15 years, First Energy. And we brought capital in from all over the world. And that basin started to spend 20 billion, 30 billion. By, by 2014, we were spending 85 billion a year in the basin. What I'm trying to tell people today is that this basin's um, cycle is changing again. And this is the opportunity that the investor must understand. It's gone from an exploration basin to an exploitation basin. It is now becoming a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. It has really matured. And in fact, on two levels, it's going to be very, very lucrative. One, by maturing means it's going to give back. It's manufacturing, it's distributing cash now back to people. Right. It's not growing and growing risk. CapEx and further expenditures. Growing volume, growing debt, growing yeah. decline rates, fall off a cliff. These are businesses that have hunkered in and they're, spe they're, they're spending less than their cash flow. They have no more debt and they're giving money back. Not, not to you and me first. They're giving it back to themselves, their shareholders. Can I ask you about that? Sorry to take you on a tangent, but... Is that driven largely by the investor sentiment, you think? The shareholder, the, the board, the, it was like driven, they're sick and tired of this story of, it was of driven never by getting your money back? That, and it was coincident with the maturity of the basin. In other words, there isn't an option to go back to growing. Right, there, we're done with that. It's done. And, num and the second reason it's done is there's a limitation with the services available too. 30% increase in service costs last year, and they just tweaked their spending. So it's very inflationary for them too. So there is no plethora of supply coming our way. And, and, and the good news for Canadians too 
is it's not just going to be lucrative as an investment. It's going to be lucrative from a tax perspective. The, the Alberta government is going to, on average, oil sands royalties on average since 1990 were $3.1 billion a year. The oil sands paid the government $21 billion last year. Hmm. And the federal government on income tax from the dividends and the taxation of the producers is eclipsing their budget expectations. So the, the thing I want to point out, though, is the investor, if they're investing in energy and they're investing in the energy index, for instance, and you look on slide five here, yeah. slide five shows you how the index is structured. It's the old way the basin operated. And you can see our two funds, that doesn't include the alpha fund, it's that OM product, but the two conventional long only funds are structured very differently. Look at the amount of energy services exposure. There's no energy services exposure in the index. And yet this inflation that's happening is benefiting the services. It's got to be captured there more than in So the... that's why we're capturing it. So just quick pause, a reminder, uh, Canoe Financial, Rafi's the portfolio manager with Canoe Financial. Their flagship fund is the Canoe Energy Portfolio Fund. And you also have it in a, you also have it in an income series, right? This, the, this one's larger than this one, right? This one's about three times larger yeah. than that one. So the flagship fund is Canoe Energy Portfolio. And then the, the secondary fund is more of an income. It's Canoe Energy Income Portfolio. And then you also have an OM offering memorandum portfolio. But these two funds is it's kind of, this is what you do. This is what we do. A couple billion dollars. This is what you do. You've done quite well, obviously. You're talking about services now. So obviously the ETF or the XEG or whatever you want to call it is 1.8% services and you're in the 30s, 30% yeah. services because yeah. you want to capture that inflation. And and remember, like we are not stock pickers. We take these subsectors on the side here, and that's what we focus on. We pick these subsectors, and our risk is in timing those sectors. When do we get into them? When do I get into the gas sector is way more important than what gas stocks I buy. I don't buy risky gas stocks. I buy the names everybody knows. I buy ARC, I buy Tourmaline, I buy Paramount. Those are all very good quality gas stocks. So I take the risk of buying the stock out. The risk is, did I buy gas at the right time? We sold our gas positions down substantially in December when we saw that it was discounting a much colder winter than could happen. And we replaced it with energy services. And we're outperforming the index because of that trade. I'd almost say like you and I, our jobs are, are comparable in that people think a portfolio manager like me, all I am is a stock picker, but really, I'm an asset allocator. Bingo. And you're an asset allocator inside your own sector. Exactly the same. And you might be, you know, you might have picked tourmaline or maybe you should have picked Baytex or whatever. But at the end of the day, those are, are, are basis points different. Whereby picking the asset allocation the in the right sector, time. services instead of gas, you added, I don't know, 5% five, 5 or something to the portfolio's performance. Same thing with us. You know, when we, when we got out of fixed income, when we got out of bonds, and when we, you know, cut our equity exposure and added to alternatives prior to this most recent market cycle, we weren't picking Walmart instead of Home Depot. We were reducing exposure to a sector and that's, that's how that's, we all perform. That is exactly the same thing. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't really know that. So that's interesting. So the next slide um, really is another philosophical conversation. This is about what we looked at prior to help us understand what's happening now. And this is where I think we should spend the most time, frankly. When we looked back, this time last year, investors should understand oil was running hot. It was $110. Powell was panicking. Inflation was going crazy. They were admitting that transitory inflation wasn't real. It was probably more deeper seated. And interest rates were looking bad. The economy globally was starting to crumble and it was getting really risky. What happened to defer that? The primary source of that problem was cost of energy. And first, the uh, Russians invaded Ukraine. Now, why is that good for oil prices coming down? Because the global market was very against Putin and they were going to sanction him. And But they, they said, you did a bad thing and we're going to sanction you, but we're not going to do it till December. <laughs> and we're going to get rid of those service companies that are helping you enhance that, but we're not going to make them leave you till December because we need your resource. So he started to produce at an aggressive pace. And by the middle of summer, 
He had the highest production rate he's ever produced in the history of Putin, Russia. Yeah. Putin. Yeah. Pumping it into the world, putting a damper on the price. Yeah, tons of supply. Then China shuts down and they take 1.8 to 2.5 million barrels of demand out of the market. Boom, yeah. just like that. That's you're talking daily demand, obviously. Daily demand. So and that's that's, that's what percent? That's that's three percent. Three percent, yeah. Yeah. And then um, Biden decides that this SPR, which is a huge, massive underground reserve of oil that they have, which is supposed to be there for emergencies after the Yemenis war back in the 70s that it was created for, he decides he wants to use it to try to get the price at the pump down before the midterms. Right. He uses it politically. To get some seats. Yeah. So he gets 400,000 barrels a day, roughly, of pumping oil into the system again. All of these things subdued the price of oil to where it was. Then you've got Russia cutting off gas to Europe. They panic and they start buying gas everywhere they can get it for exorbitant prices. The, the, and they pay so much for it that European Union looks like it's about to break down. And they have the fourth warmest winter in 90 years. All of these things cooled the, like, the, the energy story for yeah, a little it, while it here. Killed the, it killed the price. It killed the story. And so it, it killed made the everybody buzz. look at energy and go, energy got killed. Yeah. What they should have been doing is going, thank goodness that happened because it cooled inflation from spiraling out of control. Ruining the economy. And it's causing this landing to be softer than harder. And... What's great for the energy investor is that those headwinds that I mentioned have all turned around and become tailwinds. Hmm. The SPR needs to be refilled. Now it's empty. The Russian sanctions are in place and they're already declining now. They're down some 700,000 barrels of production. And Russia and China's back on track right. coming back. So all of these things are starting to create the rebuild while the recession continues to put pressure on the other sectors. Okay, so this is very macro, right? This is very That's macro in, yeah. in, in the sector as a whole. So uh, obviously, when do you expect... So you're, you think that energy prices are, are depressed right now and we're going to see some move in the next six months or something like that. You think it's, it's coming? Well, I would argue that if I could even sustain the price today, I think this is still the best investment in energy I've ever seen in my 31 years. The best? The best. Well, I would say that buying in, in April of 2020 when uh, would have been pretty good, would it not have been? But you know what I did? No, because I'm, I'm also a risk manager. Fair enough. Risk On a risk-adjusted basis. Right. Buying today, there's no Correct. real downside, you're saying. Correct. Some of these companies I looked at, was it Baytex I looked at this morning, like trading at like one and a half or two times cash flow or something like yeah. that. Like you, you could take the company private yeah. in two years. Yeah. Like, and, and they need more inventory. That's why they made that purchase in, yeah. in Texas. And I'm not trying to drill you on Baytex. But, I just I thought of that. But you're, you're right. Like these are um, the best in class businesses that are trading at the lowest valuations in their cleanest balance sheets and, and most profitable situation they've been in in my career at their lowest valuations. Because well, of the debt mostly, right? Yeah. And mainly there's, there's no debt. They're yeah. gone. Yeah. So that's a very, very important you know, thing to recognize that we are, we are in a period of time where, you know, this is a really interesting chart here because it shows you what did happen with COVID. You take COVID out, which is this little dip, and you see that we're still now just back to the bottom that the energy sector has ever hit in its history. Wow. That was a very, very unique aberration. So for people who think they missed it, Yes, yeah. these stocks are up 20 times, some of them. But the other thing I want you to understand, the ignorance that the market has towards energy. This is an industry, the way I just described to you last year, energy was going to derail the global economy and probably elevate geopolitical risk at a biblical scale. I still think it has the potential to elevate geopolitical risk at a biblical scale. But we cooled its influence on the economy through those, those actions, those temporary actions. Yet the market, a year and a half earlier, thought that that sector was only worth 1.9% of the S&P. Right. That shows you how stupid and ignorant the market is about it. Naive and vulnerable. Because it's been indoctrinated in this globalization world by all these young kids running money, thinking growth and tech is all that matters. 
And power is your God-given right. And power should not cost money. And they've become, they've become ignorant of the old economy. And what's going to happen here is it's going to be the revenge of the old economy and the revenge of the commodity price and, and supply because of this lack of awareness that we need. All the time, this new movement against energy was banking on trillions of dollars that would be spent on alternative energy and something would happen. Right. We called it the energy transition. That was a very convenient word to use to make people think we're transitioning into something. There isn't anything. The only transition that's happened in the last 30 years is gas, is coal to gas. That's it. The only one we see of any viable source over the next 20 years is maybe coal and some oil to nuclear. None of the other ones are anything but experiments at this point. And they're so far away from being ready for infrastructure right. and all that. The wind and solar isn't effective. You cannot get the battery, the storage of that energy for when it's needed. Now, we do have alternative energy and energy technology in our funds. The investors should not be making that decision themselves. It's not fair. I can barely do it and we're supposed to be the fiduciary with intellect. We have investments that are planted in the funds in bulk battery storage. We have investment that, that Goldman Sachs private equity has now put capital into, 250 million US. We, and we're the largest shareholders in all of these companies. We have an investment in a, in a biodiesel business in Southern Alberta that's selling biodiesel to California's robust market. We have a, a water recycling business that is taking Canadian water recycling technology. We can leach H2S out of water and no one else in the Permian can do it. We took it down there. That was a business with a 7 million EBITDA. He's going to do 28 million of EBITDA next year, 70% of it out of the Permian now. All Canadian, and that's our, our fund's money doing real change difference. It's only 14% of the fund, all of that. But that's how you should be exposed to that sector right now. You should not be aggressively exposed. It's not where all of the opportunity is. Per your point, Rob, it should be in all those really cheap oil stocks that are being used today. And that's where we're exposed. Right. And I want to get back to this conversation. I want to remind uh, everyone at this table to not pound the table as hard as, as we want to pound the table. <laughs> Man, you're, you're so articulate, Rafi. Like, this is the one thing I love. Well, I love a lot of things about you, but like, like you, you sound like, like you're, you're so articulate when you describe this. Like, remind me to, to talk to you more often about this, but sometimes I forget. Sometimes I forget <laughs> the story. This story here, this slide that we're showing you guys right now, slide seven, on the percentage of CapEx, uh, percentage of, excuse me, percentage of the, of the market as a whole. You talked about the inning that we're in, or yeah. maybe I, that's what I heard. You know, oh, I've missed it because, you know, because Suncor is already up, you know, 40%, yeah. and then Baytex has quintupled, and some really small caps have gone up way more. Where do you think we are on that scale? It, well, first of all, the inning has changed. The innings have changed. We're no longer in the old innings of spending multiples of cash flow and growing. So, so it's not the same game. It's not even the same game. Yeah. We're now just really harvesting. It's a now more of ever before a net present value of future cash flows. Bingo. But the market Bingo. isn't reflecting that. No. The they... market's treating it like it's still an exploratory yes, game. Yes, exactly. And yet, if we measured this like a bank stock, which it, I get that it's not, but, it, but it's way more than it ever has been. Right? And if you measure it, you know, bank stocks trade at 10 to 15 or 10 to 20 times earnings, and yet this is turning into that and we're still trading at two times. So right? let's figure out how to value that. Let's do it. If you look on slide nine, yeah. you can see that that, that gray num chart there, yeah. the gray shows that the S&P representation is about 5% for what we saw earlier. Look at the earnings power of the group right now. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's at 14%. And you typically marry up to it. Right. So either the market strong correlation. Right? Either the market's wrong or we're wrong. Yeah. And by by we being wrong, you'd have to say like oil prices are going to fall dramatically and there's going to be losses yeah. and whatever. But I mean at this point that's, you know, that seems like a stretch. Well, let's get philosophical here. The way to look at that is you have either demand or supply. Yeah. The demand side, I want everybody listeners should think about the world from a developed world and an undeveloped world. The developed world the, that's less population than the undeveloped world. There's about 3.1 billion of us and there's about 4.8 billion of them. Our world produces 30 million barrels. We consume 46. We're, we're oil pigs. 
So the developing world, they don't have a middle class, they don't have transportation, they don't have buildings, they don't have health care. They have people still living in poverty, burning dung, that we're going to convert them into energy addiction people. And so they are not going to, their, their worry about the climate is zero. Because you know what? Exceeds, they got to survive first. It's, poverty, it's Maslow's triangle. Bingo. And so the world, our naivety is that we're, we're controlled and dictated by influencers like the Kardashians. They are focused on life and death. And we are naively being told otherwise while they continue to use it. The demand is growing out of control. So we can't suppress that, not without eliminating the developing world. The problem is the developing world has all the oil too that we need, and they're going to use it to grow. And to get there faster, they're going to create a, it, it that threatens us geopolitically. So you expect an elevated geopolitical risk globally as well from all of that. And then on, on top of all that, I think we're, we're the producers. So, so we have that, that problem. So now you need supply. How are we going to get the supply? And for some reason, the world thinks that the producers should just produce more. Why would they produce more when they're constantly being threatened that they're going to get taxed more? Nobody, I'm an economist by background, and in first year university, they teach you, if you want to reduce something, tax it. That's why we tax cigarettes. Cigarettes, alcohol, yeah. Yeah. It's an inelastic product, and the more we tax it, the idea is to, they'll use it less. Now, we're taxing, threatening to tax the oil industry, but yet we're telling them to produce more. That won't happen. That's not even logical. So you need to incent the sector, and there's no, there's no way the governments are in a phase of incenting yet. So there is no supply coming either. So these producers are just sitting back. They're running very simple businesses and they are making more money than they've ever made in their history of their businesses. More profitable than they've ever been. There's no reason to shift from that. Can you talk about that? Like the, the, how profitable these companies the are? Just put this in perspective for someone who doesn't follow this that closely. I know you, the, the best way is on slide 12. Okay. On slide 12, it shows total dividends, variable and regular. And that adds up to 6% for the energy industry. Right. The entire S&P average is 1.9%. Yeah, but I mean, a skeptic could easily say higher payout ratios or, or you know, they're paying out numbers that are not real. They're paying out, uh, they're, they're, they're distributing less than the free cash they're generating. Yeah, so that's kind of... Okay, so I was curling on Tuesday last week. Yeah, I with, curled Thursday last week. With one of the guys on this list here. Okay. And he's sitting with me, a CEO of one of those companies, and he's sitting there listening to me. We're, ta we're talking about some things. And out of the blue, he goes, I don't, I, I cannot, I, I have hundreds of millions of dollars this year that I'm generating, and I don't know what I'm going to do with it. And he's already doing a very robust dividend. Yeah. And what they're going to do with it ultimately. Buybacks? No, they're going to, I think the market over time, is going to start to see this as a, as a discipline. It's not been done enough. And once it's done, remember, you're going from a, a thoroughbred business that had high volatility. Now you're going to be a manufacturing dividend company. The market isn't ready for it's that It's not going to respect it, right? So time will cause people to create confidence in that. And over that time, they'll chase the yield down and the equity prices will go up. And what will he do with that cash? feed it more dividend. Yeah, you think he's going to slowly increase his dividend every quarter? He's going to announce a dividend increase. As, when the market starts to take it down, they'll start feeding it more and the capital return will grow. Yeah, because it's, it's a, going to be a dr like a drag, right? Like yeah. all that cash is a drag on performance. You right. need to do something with it. So, so the best way to describe that is in this right here. If you look on slide 17, yeah. And we're featuring, we think the income fund is actually the right place to focus on your risk and your reward right now. Your downside is much more limited for the amount of upside in the yield. Historically, the industry only distributed about $10 billion a year. That was the, the pipelines and the oil sands and the Algonquins and the Interjexes. Yeah. These companies are all distributing in excess of their free, all of their free cash flow. 
They're five, six times debt to cash flow right, right. now. They're in trouble. And that $10 billion of dividends is a very volatile... That's the old economy. Uh, that's what the TSX Energy Index I showed you is represented by. Right. But where did this... Look, in 2022, we distributed $30 billion more dollars. Where did that come from? That's this new entrant of energy services and producers that have all converted to that because of the maturity of the basin. And they're not going to do something else. So it's going to continue, we believe. And that's what I'm telling investors to buy into. Yeah, but two-thirds of this is buybacks, right? Or, or No, or... this is... Yeah, two th- yeah. so th- that means they'll turn from buybacks. to That's what they're doing right now. You, you think they don't have a choice now because the market wouldn't respect well, the dividend? Two, or... two reasons why you'll see that shrink. One, the governments are taxing it starting the end of next right. year. Okay, yeah. And number, and which I think is a good move on their part. And number two is the cash has to be put into the system somewhere. So you'll see substantially reduced buybacks, and that that then the cash will have to go back into. What the if okay? So the CEO that you're curling with on Tuesday, if he were to actually pay out his his uh, like a, a reasonable dividend that he wouldn't. Not to scare the market, what could that dividend yield go 18%. to? 18%. 18%. His could be 18%. His dividend yield could be 18%. Yeah. And that's still like yeah. half the cash flow. You, the... you know what people don't realize? Tourmaline has for five quarters, four, four quarters now, done a special dividend right. along with its regular dividend. Right. And that equates to 9%. Yeah. Tourmaline's they, they don't 9%. see it as a, as, a, as a dividend yield because they think it's a special dividend. Right. But you're saying it's permanent. Well, he owns 13 million shares, so you tell me what his interest is in making money or going and leaving that profitable, most profitable situation he's ever been in and go take risk where a government is threatening to tax you to grow production. And, and remember, like, there's no more services available. In, the inflation was 30% last year. This yeah. year, what's it going to be if they have to increase spending? And all of these producers in North America... Every year, they produce less and less quality wells because they, they drill their best quality right. well every year. And there's a declining. And there's a decline. So to keep it flat, they got to drill more wells to keep that production flat, let alone grow it. How's this draw weight? <laughs> Don't. No, I'm not. If you ever saw this, I'm not. No. <laughs> no, you're not saying it's him. It could be any, any, it could be <laughs> any CEO at any, no. any firm. But... <laughs> <It's> uh, <laughs> 25 years we've curled together. There's no way I'm talking about it. No, he's, he's always outside <laughs> on the intern, right? Always, always, <laughs> I'm not always. bringing it up. I think, I think he can sweep a little harder, that's yeah. for sure. But Yeah, doesn't, doesn't take the team to heart. Um, let's talk about uh, any other story you want to tell. I just, so the, obviously, only, the, one, yeah. the one other feature I would like to talk about probably would be slide um, Cause it, 14. It's a compelling argument, right? Like to well, me, if you were to break it down, and I know you want to get to this, but if you were to break it down to like, you know, my cousin who doesn't follow anything in the stock market, doesn't understand it, doesn't know what it is, you were to just explain to her why she should own, first off, what percentage of this do you think she should own? Of your fund, do you think, do you think it, I would it, max out your risk sleeve that you can own in this area? Yeah. Period. So whatever your risk sleeve is, it if that's ten percent, this alone. So you take it out of crypto, take it out oh of SPACs, take it out of all of that, and just load up into energy. I get that question often, and that's how I respond. And I'm telling you, in my 31 years, I would never have said that more with more conviction than I do today. You've always been like, probably maybe to a fault, defensive, yes. right? Almost too conservative. I remember some eras where you had a ton of cash, and you were telling me. Rob, like I'm, I'm protecting your client's capital, bingo, and you've always been defensive. So to hear you say that, I think, emphasizes how strongly you feel about bingo. this. So, so you're not of the view that Canadians in their regular equity exposure should have some of this. You think it should be kind of in their risk sleeve. It it should be their risk sleeve, only um, because you will find that the regulations from a compliance perspective will force you to do that. I get it. Yeah, I don't think it's as risky. And 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 my um, my my sales partner here, Travis, and I have debated it here today. Too. Yeah, he's got a hundred percent of his net worth in this. He thinks that well, he thinks that they the, that they'll, that will be challenged by the compliance over the next few years. I'm saying over time, as this basin is well understood, what's happening, and if I'm right, there will be an understanding that this industry is no longer the thoroughbred volatile sector it was. It's less risky today. One that is very low risk now is the oil sands. And don't think of the oil sands 
like the conventional production. It's more of a, it's already been a manufacturer for years and years and years. Right. So it's a mature manufacturer. It's getting criticized for its emissions. And, but it's a bit of a separate argument. So then. what I'm trying to say to people is that's going to change too. Some people will start have, may have already noticed it of your, of your listeners, but people who have it, I would encourage them to look it up, and our slide here will help. There's something they developed called Pathways Alliance. They started developing that a year ago, and that's the six largest oil sands yep. producers who are saying, we have something very unique in Canada that nowhere else in the world we have. In our geological basin, we have these massive underground geological seas that were created millions of years ago. Huge cavernous seas. They can take the CO2 emissions and pipe it all the way down to Cold Lake, where the sea is below it, and pump the emissions down there for decades to come. Now, by doing that, they will go from the dirtiest oil, according to you know, some people who say that, to the cleanest oil on the planet. And we are already a very reputable jurisdiction to invest in. To be able to be a reputable jurisdiction and the place where you can buy energy, the valuation of energy in Canada could change overnight with that. So our government, luckily, is willing to talk about that now. And that tells me that our government is actually concerned about climate because there are other people who say, no, we won't let that happen. That's wrong. Well, then they're just frustrated by oil. I thought the problem is climate. These guys are finding a solution. Now, it's more complex than that in that it's a $75 billion project from cradle to grave over the life of it. And they want the government to pay for half of it. And they want to write off their costs against their revenue. So now their royalties will be um, less for a little while. And they want to reduce the carbon tax from it. And they want the personal carbon tax to be less too. And we're all going to be better off. We'll live a lower cost environment. And these companies will be more profitable. And they'll be able to distribute more profit to investors directly instead of going through the bureaucrats. It's a very healthy solution. And so these are all real things that are happening that are trying to make a difference. And I think it makes it bodes very well for the oil sands. Okay, so I just want to finish the, the, the piece I was trying to get to earlier. So if you were to say it to my cousin who doesn't understand, she's got 10% sleeve, you're telling her to put it all in here. The main reasons are one, on a macro side, you think price of, of traditional oil and gas, however you want to look at it, or energy is depressed right now for X, Y, and Z that you've outlined earlier. And second of all, the companies are trading at discounts that makes no sense. I, I, would, say, or I, I would say the first thing I thought of when you said that is you need to convince your cousin how addicted to oil she is. She doesn't realize it. And the demand is out of control. They all think that they're going to get an electric car and that they're going to eliminate their use of oil. That, that's, that's a complete falsehood. Well, Not to mention that the, the electric car is plugged into a wall that uses um, oil to, to, to start it. You can't take the 20 million, you can take the 20 million electric cars today that exist on the planet versus the 2 billion that exist in ICE cars and plug them in. But if you take that 20 million and turn it into 60 million cars, you'll, the whole system will break down. There isn't an infrastructure to even remotely handle that. It will take decades to build that infrastructure out, actually rebuild the infrastructure. And then on top of that, you've got to fuel it with some other pixie dust and fairy tale fake fuel that doesn't even exist yet. So it, it, it's not even common sense yet. Today, here and now, we have a structural deficit in the supply of the thing that we're all addicted to. Oil. Oil. Running. Oil is most people, for me, it's running. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. okay. Good for you. Okay, so go, let's go back to slide 14. You wanted to touch on this. Uh, well, that, that's the, that, that pathway is just have clients read that. Okay, yeah. And they'll understand. And, and, and recognize this too. Like, um, where is this oil otherwise going to come from? Like, we actually should be expanding the oil sands globally. That is a way, if we're able to find it the cleanest way possible, then let's expand it. Because recognize this, you've got a situation globally where oil expanded production in North America by 82% in North America since 2008. The rest of the world's production declined by 6%. And that's 76% of the global production. So that production is going like this. 
And that was because we were attacking the super majors and making them spend money on these frivolous experiments right. instead of growing their production. To turn that momentum of that decline rate down will take hundreds of billions of dollars and several years. So just to get that to turn around will take years. We're not even at that point where we're trying to turn it around yet. So we are in a supply declining environment while we are becoming more addicted to oil, especially when you think about it in those two worlds, the developed versus undeveloped world. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one last question because I do wanna respect your time. Um, I had Eric Natal on, on my show a while back and uh, similar, very bullish. Surprise, surprise, the, the two guys that are running the energy mm -hmm. funds are extremely bullish. Um, but I know that his fund is, is more volatile than yours. Uh, so who should be buying your fund relative to that fund? I know you don't want to yeah. say anything. No, no, Eric, it's very, Eric's no, a smart guy, but like different. Who, who's buying your fund? I get asked to this, that question all the time, and it's a very simple answer. First of all, Eric and I, our thinking and our process is identical. We're both captured the same opportunity. It's very, very obvious opportunity. The difference between our two funds is our fund is developing a global reach of energy aspects. Um, and we have a much larger uh, view of how you define energy. We look at oil, gas, energy services, midstream, downstream, refining, LNG, alternative energy, energy technology, all those things. And we play them off each other. And we're top-down investors looking at the cycles, trying to move money in and out of areas as you see fit. Whereas Eric is saying, I'm really excited about energy and I'm going to give you high octane all the time. Right. And so if you want to get in and out, when you want to get in and out, come to me and I will give you maximum exposure. We won't necessarily be giving you maximum exposure. You're a permanent holding for that sector and you're going to manage the risk. Do, that's not criticizing what he's doing. It's two completely different mindsets. It. Yep. And, and I have no problem with that. And actually... I commend him with his discipline. He ha he should be doing that. And it, it's equally hard for me with my discipline because you want to trade. You want to gravitate to the volatility. My trader loves to do that. I'm constantly holding him back because I'm a pessimist by nature, as you pointed yeah. out. And so it, 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 I'm, a, I'm a defensive player of something I know a lot about. Okay, I'm going to ask you, I said last question. This one is your real last question. You are a PM. You're on my show. What's your top name right now that you love? You know, probably my top or name. Top two. I'll give you. I'll give you two. How about that? I'll, I'd say the first one is a is a smaller producer called Headwater, playing it, uh, in a play called The Clearwater. Okay. And uh, incredible return uh, re results because they don't drill those frac horizontal wells. They drill these vertical and horizontal without frac, and they. They pay out in two months, these wells. Wow. But it's, I, I can't find a play in North America that, that is that okay. Headwater is one of them? So Headwater would be one of them. And I would say... Um, Maybe in the mid-cap space. Or, the Paramount. Or the, the Paramount. Then you've got a gas producer that is what we call a wet gas producer. Wet meaning they produce condensate with it. That condensate is getting higher prices than WTI right now. Hmm. And it just falls out at the wellhead and they make a ton of money off it. So... Um, no transportation cost other, otherwise. So hugely profitable. They're a gas producer, but way more profitable than, say, Pado, because Pado has no liquids. And so their net back is a quarter of Paramount's. Okay. Yet they're both called gas producers. Right. One is massively more profitable like than the other. There's no way the retail market understands that. Oh, God. There's no. a disconnect. No, no, no. And your job is to take That's advantage okay. of That's okay. That's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. I get paid big bucks to do that. All right. Any last words? I would just say to you, focus on, at the bottom of a cycle, focus on the energy income right now while the volatility is going. You don't have to take a lot of risk. Stay away from the vol, get your yield, and you're going to get 18 potentially uh, over the next whatever while, while the yields make up. And if you don't actually get the yield today, the cash is still there, you're saying. It's just going to have to accumulate somehow. I don't need oil prices to go to 100. They can stay at 80. And these businesses are going to mint it. Awesome.
All right, thanks so much, Rafi Tamazian, uh, running the energy uh, portfolio over at Canoe. Couple billion dollars, Lipper award winner. He's been killing it on the Lipper side, killer, killing it with uh, best performance, manages a ton. Canoe's been also a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, fund manager uh, for us. On, we use them on the private equity side as well. You've seen some of our videos there. So take a sec, like, subscribe, follow, smash the bell, guys. If you wanna know when the new content's put out, you're a subscriber of our channel, right? I have not. I was not Dude, aware. you can't. You got to be like, yeah, I subscribe. <laughs> All right. So you're going to subscribe to our channel. I have no digital footprint whatsoever. You, you watch YouTube. <laughs> no, I don't. You've <laughs> never watched YouTube ever. I mean, my son puts it on and I watch, but I, what am I? I've got to read. <laughs> I'm reading constantly. Oh I spent my, my whole life Raffy, okay. with this. So they good. tried to get me to put a Twitter account together. I'm like, I tweeting? I, I, what? Heart rate <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Okay, so anyways, he's going to sign up. You're going to sign up. You're going to register. Put your thoughts below if you'd love to hear more about this. Questions I should ask for Rafi. Next time I get him on the show, put them down below. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I'm Rob Tatro from robtatro.com. If you'd like to book a no-obligation consultation to chat about this, the exposure, or anything else in your portfolio, go to www.speaktorob.com. We'd love to book a no-obligation consultation. Thanks, guys. We'll see you in the next video.